Um, my name is Bethan Emmett from Help Age International and also from um, the Group Proof and Poverty Coalition. Um, thanks to both presenters, really interesting stuff in there. I'm trying to link both of these through. My primary concern is about the, the forthcoming strategy um, and a little bit of a question mark over banks' operational in particularly sort of this idea about favoured instruments around public works as well. Picking up on a statistic, I think from Laura's presentation, that in the past 10 years worth of work, something like almost 40% of public works projects had the objective of, of building infrastructure, um, which in a poverty reduction program seems like a slightly strange or a objective. I'm just wondering, I think we've seen help aid in a number of countries, um, bank operations still very much favouring public works, um, which is fine, but there are question marks there, I think, in terms of objectives, um, particularly looking at things like, um, are they there for infrastructure development? Is this about poverty reduction? They seem to be more expensive than other programmes. They seem to exclude other certain groups. And is this going to be the bank's favoured tool in terms of promotion, especially given that, given that because they're short-term and time-limited and also take up people's time, um, um, you know, is that where skills development is going to happen? Is that how um, livelihoods are going to be developed? So there's a bit of a question mark for me. Um, this is targeted towards Laura over the, the inclusion of public works programs in the ongoing strategy and, and what the real objectives are and, and how they're going to um, address poverty reduction specifically rather than things like infrastructure development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, why don't we work our way around? Um, Christian Nibor from, um, I'm the Chief of Social and Economic Policy Research at UNICEF in the Chanty Centre in Florence. Um, for me, I was passing by in London that is was happening today because UNICEF is struggling with the same questions as the World Bank does. Um, I'm afraid we, we are now going to evaluate our social protection interventions in, in Africa. Uh, and I'm afraid we will come to the same type of conclusions as the World Bank does, which I think is fragmentation is one of these these big conclusions, both internally, um, UNICEF suffers from the same problem as the bank does, sectors not discussing with each other, each other things, um, but also inter-agency inter uh, lack of coordination, not between the World Bank and UNICEF, doing duplicating each other, doing sometimes contradictory things, uh, and things like that. My main question in this, in this remark, and I wonder whether you had thought about a solution in that, in that direction, is our coordination with governments. Um, a lot of the countries we're working in are not the really easiest countries to deal with governments. Not only are the governments there fragmented as well, but also um, not very democratic, not very concerned about the poor, um, in some countries not concerned at all about the poor. Nevertheless, we have to work in that, in, in this context, and, it's, um, and that's really a challenge. I don't have an answer to that, but it's really something I think we all suffer from, all the donors, the, the development uh, academic communities and, and the international organization. Second is, is a remark where, b mostly to Laura, that we, s we started with UNICEF of bringing all the evidence together in a database, uh, which will be open soon. We work together there with uh, McGill Universities. And after a year, we all go out and say, yeah, we solved it and did it, knowing that in five years' time, there will be exactly the same crisis coming. And that's where we, don't, we have to coordinate with even the, the organizations that are good in shop, shock absorbing things, where we have to say, okay, the next crisis we can prevent if we work together with the Ethiopian government. And of course, it's political and difficult, that's one, but I think we can do that. Thank you. I mean, we've accumulated quite a lot, so I think if we take maybe one more question and then we'll hand it back to the two speakers. Um, Joe Hanlon, I'm co author with Armando Barrientos of Just Give Money to the Poor. Um, I was recent. I, I want to pick up this fragmentation issue and both fragmentation within the World Bank but also donor fragmentation and the way in which the bank in practice is pushing donor fragmentation because I've just recently been working in South Welcome. Sudan. I mean, th there is a certain consistency here, which is, is public works seen as the desired instrument in low-income countries? Um, and if so, are there concerns about that? Is it compatible to do poverty reduction, I guess, directly through the transfer as well as through or at the same time as building infrastructure? 
Um, there was a, an observation from UNICEF that um, just noting that they are they're about to begin a similar exercise of um, evaluating their own safety nets program, social protection program, and thinking forward um, that would welcome sort of sharing of information and data and analytical tools, um, and the issue of within donor and between donor coordination. Um, Joe Hanlon uh, talking about donor fragmentation in South Sudan, where apparently the bank has been um, sort of counter-programming a UN and government focus on a child grant for public works programming. And then Angela Penrose from Guff, uh, I can never pronounce it, Grow Up Free From Poverty. I, I, don't, I think it's one that cannot be turned into an acronym. Um, <laughs> uh, just saying what, well, I mean, what is the bank's position with regard to the social protection floor? Um, you know, is that seen as a standard around which to, you know, to, to harmonize? Um, is, you know, is the bank, does the bank have an alternative? Um, and yeah, how do, how do the various multilaterals, I suspect bilaterals as well at some stage, um, you know, how do we, how do we work with governments and hold in check our own preferred positions and try and give them the capacity but without, you know, setting them down certain sets of tram lines? Is that roughly right? Does anybody think I've travestied their question? <laughs> is that okay? All right. Um, so, Laura, over to you. Let me start with just a few points, um, picking up on Rachel's comments, because I, I was also able to hear all of those. And, uh, and I think they were terrific comments. So uh, many, many thanks, Rachel, to you for that. Uh, I think on, on your first point is, is a very good one um, about uh, looking at crisis response and chronic poverty and uh, the relative, the role of, um, of different institutions uh, and, and this question of what counter cyclical will look like when we um, seem to be entering actually this longer period of, of slowdown. And I think that's actually um, sort of precisely the answer. There's on one of our blog posts when we had this discussion forum, we, we put forward this question, is crisis the new normal? And I think it's a real question. So I don't see countries um, uh, as being able to not afford to look at crises. And likewise, social protection systems are unfortunately um, going to be called upon to in fact address both the needs of um, the chronic poor and the acute poor, as well as counter cyclical responses. And what we have found is that it's very important to have those sorts of programs and systems in place um, before crises hit uh, so that they can respond effectively. And those systems are often the ones that are addressing um, some of the chronic poor, but then there are features that are obviously gonna be different, um, particularly in, this, in the face of, um, of large covariate shocks. And so the real question is what is the what, and, and that's why the system perspective is important because often what it's been is there's been one or maybe two programs in place that have been called upon um, because mainly they were there and they were the ones that were available to respond to crises, but perhaps they weren't in fact the best instruments. And I think there's been a lot of very healthy debate around this about what are the types of instruments um, that could be uh, you know, dormant, if you will, and can kick in during crises, or how do you adapt existing instrument to respond to crises? And I think, I think this lens is also extremely useful for surfacing some of the other questions that have come up, um, including around public works and including uh, around targeting. So uh, clearly, if you just take sort of the, the classic examples of, of uh, a targeted uh, um, cash transfer program uh, targeted toward poor, uh, low-income families, um, often with children, which is often the case with, with conditional cash transfers or with some sort of um, child grants or poverty-oriented cash transfers, and then sort of your classic public works programs. Th those are two kind of big program tools in the toolkit, but perhaps neither one is fully appropriate. The, the more uh, chronic poor and cash transfers for responding to the crises, particularly if you don't have a way of bringing people quickly 
uh, into uh, the list of beneficiaries if it's, if it's a little more oriented, as they often are, toward uh, targeting and looking for, for eligibility through the lens of chronic poverty. And then likewise, if public works is seen as the go-to response for crisis response, that's going to miss perhaps some of the most vulnerable families who do not have um, available labor supply to be able to, uh, to, to go and find that job in, in a public work situation. So I think depending on that context, you have two of your most classic instruments that in fact don't look quite right to respond um, in either case. And so I think there is this real challenge um, to be able to not only work with how to adapt existing instruments, but to also really push ourselves to see what are, what are some of the, the better responses and what sorts of flexibility um, do, do you need for crisis response and how do you pay for it. And I think that is key about having that notion of you know, how do you put in the rainy day funds or the counter cyclicality? Do you need to look further uh, in terms of, of grants, um, in terms of a donor role, um, or further in terms of concessional financing? And, and the bank has done a lot here. I mean, all, all the whole donor community, but the bank has had, uh, you know, tremendous international response for um, IDA replenishments. And we have also um, been very engaged in the Rapid Social Response Fund, um, which is a grant facility for uh, IDA countries to set up uh, and implement social protection systems precisely with this view toward, um, toward crisis response. So that's answering, um, I think, addressing a few of the, the questions that were, that were set up. I think I, we would agree fully, and it resonates with the presentation, about the need for donor coordination around systems. So Rachel, very much your second point. Um, and, uh, and, and also uh, this question of, um, of looking at, in the knowledge area at uh, not at, at what, are, what are different channels and different programs for reaching um, objectives that are set into place and, and particularly objectives that are set by countries and donors supporting that dialogue uh, and supporting looking at that. So, um, I think in, in these questions about comparators outside the sector, we, we would also agree that in a lot of the evaluation work, and, and I've done a lot of work in this field, I think we've been extremely focused on uh, internal validity, and in fact in terms of getting an appropriate counterfactual, but not necessarily at looking at um, external validity. So how, how effective is this instrument going to be in other contexts, and what are some of the other uh, possible alternatives in terms of reaching similar goals, and not just alternatives, but complementarities. Um, a key element that we are signaling in the strategy is, in fact, this need for multi-sectoral uh, engagement to reach many of the goals that are set forward, particularly in terms of resilience and, and opportunity. Um, uh, we would welcome and have already been in touch now turning to the questions um, in, in collaborating with UNICEF and um, myself as well as uh, Ruslan Yemstov from our Safety Nets team have been in touch with Jen um, Yablonsky about this um, and, uh, and I think that's terrific that UNICEF is looking at, at their own strategy in this point um, and so happy obviously to continue to coordinate on that. Um, I might leave it to Arup to answer the social protection floor question since he's arrived and he's there, and also to, uh, to add uh, whatever insights he would have as well as our director um, for the sector since he was able to get there on time. He must have come straight from the airport. So uh, let me leave it at that and I'm happy to pick up uh, any further threads of conversation as, as it evolves. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, a lot, Thanks Laura. Laura. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Arup Banerjee. Uh, I literally, um, if I'm sounding incoherent, I literally hopped on off a flight and on the tube, and um, I came here about uh, 10 minutes ago, but uh, I thought this was an important occasion to uh, exchange views. So I just came in when my colleague from the UNICEF was, uh, was talking about it, so I missed uh, your questions. So let me, as Laura suggested, just focus on two big, um, two or three big sort of strands from this round of uh, of comments, um, one on um, the difficulty of donor coordination, um, 
and the challenges, uh, like Joe, you put in, in specific country contexts. Um, and the second, in that context, sort of the larger donor coordination allowed the social protection flow, right? And how do you uh, move to that sort of uh, vision? And I think Laura has answered the third big strand on public works program, but I'll, I'll start with that and sort of underline perhaps what is the key idea we see going forward. What's the big uh, idea that we really want uh, to work on with all of you? The idea really is that for this multiplicity of objectives that social protection needs to cover, which is um, the prevention, protection, promotion, which is the insurance against shocks and sudden crises, the long-term chronic poverty and addressing uh, that in terms of income transfers and uh, addressing destitution, and also pulling people out of poverty through the promotion agenda, what you really need is a portfolio. And, and somehow this debate, the way I've seen it in the few years that I've uh, been engaging and reading with it, has been lots of one notes, okay? Uh, all of you, and it came out in this conversation, have come with your view, your slice, whether it be just give them the blank click cash, or whether it be think about the welfare of the children or think about the welfare of the elderly. This is really the world of social protection today. So the fragmentation is not just among us in terms of agencies. It's fragmentation among us in terms of actual programs and target groups. So one of the things that we really need to think about is for a country, and this is very much an aspirational goal for many of the countries that we work in, how can we move to the full set, of the full portfolio of programs that provide resilience and opportunity. And that's where the more prosaic challenge of donor coordination come in, comes in, right? Because actually, all of us, including the World Bank, are better than others at some slice of that portfolio. And, um, you know, so in the public works debate, and I don't know the specifics, uh, Joe, of, of the South Sudan, um, the point is that, yes, it is terribly important to protect children um, in that very, very difficult environment. The question is what happens to the working poor? And is the, are they fully covered by the child benefit? And that's where the portfolio comes in. I, and I recognize that in every specific, there'll be lots of complications. And, and also it's, and all of you who have worked in the field know that eventually this sort of donor coordination depends on the personal chemistry between the managers of the, from the various programs of the various things. It's a, it's a sad commentary, isn't it, when we're talking about these very high-level coordinations. But if you look at success and failures, and Tim, you know, you've been in country and so have many of you, uh, that's really what, uh, what works and what doesn't. So given that, uh, let's think about what donor coordination really means. And that was, I presume, Laura, the challenge slide that you put forward. The fundamental challenge, I think, and that's the one where um, I personally, but we as the World Bank, feel very strongly, and it's borne out very much by Jenny's and the IG's evaluation, is that of building these nuts and bolts systems that all of us can use. That really is the bottom line, because that is where, in a world of very scarce resources, resources not just uh, pound sterling or dollars or euros, but human resources in the lowest income context, creating our own subsystems um, is enormously wasteful. Having different targeting criteria, different beneficiary registries, different cash transfer mechanisms, this is enormously wasteful. And it is not clear that one is better than the other a priori. It's not, by the way, and all of this, I want to say that the bank is equally um, has space to move. It is not that I'm saying that, oh, the bank systems are the best and all of you guys should use the banks, uh, the systems the bank created. But it's an empirical question. And we, I want to move away from the ideological question. It's an empirical question of what's working well and how we can actually work together in order to use those systems, even if it's slightly second best for our purposes, rather than create a new one. 
So building these systems, like the Rapid Social Response Fund that um, Laura mentioned, which is already in over 40-odd low-income countries, um, started helping to build these systems through grant financing. Um, and again, for those of you who haven't, uh, don't know about this, this is actually now fully committed. It had 61 odd million dollars, 50 from the Russians, um, which is a very uh, atypical uh, donor, about 9 million uh, from the Norwegians, and about 3 million from the UK. Uh, so this rapid uh, social response fund has been now fully committed to building these systems and to providing South-South exchanges. And some of you have been to the Addis conference and Arusha conference, which really was partially financed by the RSR program. My last point on donor coordination is to recognize that it's difficult. <laughs> and for us, and for each one of you, and for the academics as well, by the way, um, because you all come in here with a particular strong, well-formed academic position that really is, I was an academic myself, so I know <laughs> where that comes from. And partly it is letting go of that. And that's really hard for us at the bank as an institution. And it's going to be hard for each one of you if you believe in this agenda. And so that's the invitation, that it is actually really, really easy, pardon me, for the bank or for any one of the agencies or academics represented here to push for our pet thing. And it is really hard to coordinate and let go of that. So it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be messy. It's going to be working out in a country by country basis based on each of our per people there who are willing to let go a bit and work cooperatively. And uh, what I'm hoping for, and what I hope you will hope for, is that in some countries, and I know of some where this is already happening, there is this chemistry between the two or three or four key players that allows people to drop their, their egos and their positions and work together for the, for the common uh, program. Last is uh, on the social protection uh, flow, and that, I think, is actually the easiest of this, uh, these agendas. Um, Michael Cinsho, who's from the ILO, who leads this uh, agenda, and my team spent a whole day Thursday in Washington um, talking about uh, this agenda. Um, and it's actually very easy, um, because if you look at the Bachelet Commission report, the version of the social protection flow that is in there, and that is um, close to the version that the ILO is espousing. As you know, the one UN position on the social protection flow and the ILO position on the social protection flow is not identical. They're actually slightly different. However, that, f that concept of the social protection flow today, as opposed to what it was two years ago, is almost identical to the systems agenda that we've been talking about. Um, it is about the same aspirational portfolio of uh, interventions that together provide the minimum for every, every uh, person in the country who needs uh, social protection. Um, what um, will, uh, no promises yet, but what Michael and I started discussing is that he had actually a PowerPoint slide about the five or six basic principles underlying the social protection flow. And we agreed that that was actually very much the same as the five or six basic principles about social protection systems. So um, except for one important point, which is that the systems agenda is an operational agenda. It is about actually doing these things, while the social protection flow is actually an advocacy agenda to advocate for this. So there's, we saw a very important um, uh, compatibility and uh, coordination uh, there. And what we are going to do, and Michael's going to be back uh, to Washington in early December, and we're going to actually work to make sure that we can figure out how we can march lockstep with the advocacy and the varied implementation that will happen in country after country after country. Um, and the bottom line, though, that's in the future is that if any country, of course, says 
that we want to implement the social protection floor and ask the bank for help, that's where our business really is in terms of the programs. So I want to, uh, I'll, I'll let me stop here, but I, I'd be happy to engage with you, not just today, but also uh, later if you'd like. Sorry for taking a bit more time, but thanks for uh, having me here. Thank everyone very much for being here and for the questions, which were really excellent questions. The role of IEG is to do an independent evaluation of the bank's work to help inform a broad range of stakeholders about how the bank is doing. And if we are able to do that and raise and ha help you raise important questions, that's very important. We are very lucky today uh, to have Laura, who woke up early in Washington to be there in a roof, who is I don't know if it's early or late for you or whatever, but you just <laughs> you came in to be here as well, because really that's the dialogue that needs to take place. You need to keep asking the questions. Uh, we will, in, IEG can inform you as best as we can, and, and thank you for the compliment, Rachel, that we pushed very hard on that Ethiopia mission. We continue to do that. The whole process is a difficult one, but the idea is that if we are being given the mandate to evaluate 10 years of World Bank work, we have to be very certain that what we're doing is rigorous. And so um, we present to, we came here to, uh, to present this to you and um, to, to help foster that dialogue with, between outside stakeholders and uh, with the World Bank. And so uh, thank you very much and thank you all. And I'll, I'll just step a tiny bit beyond my chair's role at, right at the last moment and say that you know DFID is um, is looking at very similar issues. We are under um, a similar sort of scrutiny process, um, and we we found the IEG report extremely helpful. Um, we found that quite a lot of the the um, the plus points and the proven and the you know the negative points, the the points where there was consensus and where we thought there was still a, ne a knowledge gap chimed quite well with the impressions that we had. So I think um, I think there's still quite a diversity of views and starting positions out there, but I think there's starting to be a bit more of a convergence about what we, what we know, what we don't know, um, what we need to know. So thank you. Thank you to you, Laura, and, um, and to Arup, and to Jenny, and to Rachel very much for being one foot in, one foot out, <laughs> and, and fostering this meeting. Thank you very much. And if we could just have a round of applause for um, the three speakers today.